Hello everybody and welcome to the next lecture of 6837. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the beginnings of how to develop algorithms for rendering, right? actually drawing images on the screen. Uh, and in particular, we're going to talk about a technique called ray casting uh, and talk about how we can render some very simple shapes, namely spheres and planes. So to catch up with the story so far in 6837 as a whole, um, the very first part of our course talked about modeling, right? Uh, this was both modeling the contents of an individual scene uh, using splines, you know, hierarchical transformations, meshes, and so on. And then we talked about modeling not just the static scene, but animating it in time. And we talked about a lot of different strategies for that, everything from skinning for dealing with characters uh, and making their skin deform in response to an artic articulated bone structure to uh, ordinary differential equations, or ODEs, uh, which can be used for physically-based animation, particle systems, uh, and even systems of forces that govern the motion of particles using forces that are pretty much just invented or made up by uh, the artist or the computer scientists. Um, so in particular, uh, in our previous lecture, we saw that we can build all kinds of interesting and pretty compelling approximations of physical systems just using networks of springs. But of course, the challenge was coming up with an ODE integrator that can deal with sometimes a pretty stiff uh, system to solve. In any event, we now move on to the next big chunk of 6837, which is now that we've specified a scene uh, and potentially the dynamics and contents of that scene as it changes over time, the next thing that we need to do is actually draw it on the computer screen. Of course, uh, generating an image given a scene description is probably the most core topic in the computer graphics universe. I think even the most conservative computer graphics purists would agree that this is a topic we should spend a lot of time on in a course like 6837. Uh, and indeed, we're going to spend many, many lectures on developing algorithms for rendering. So given a list of the objects in a scene, whether they're triangles or splines or hierarchies of transformations applied to other objects, um, how can we actually generate a grid of pixel colors that we can display on our monitor? So today we're going to start out pretty easy and talk about some really simple ideas that are going to motivate many of our rendering algorithms. And we're going to leave you with a very concrete uh, set of methods for drawing a sphere. <laughs> so this is a very simple uh, rendering lecture today to get started. We might end a little early. I always say that. I never manage to actually end early. Uh, and then starting next time, we're going to add more and more complexity to our rendered scenes until we get really beautiful images that involve, you know, reflections and refractions and lighting effects and so on. Okay. So today we're going to focus just on that high level question. What does the term rendering mean? And we're going to talk about the basics of the ray casting algorithm, which is used to draw content on your computer screen. And it's kind of a step toward ray tracing, um, which is probably one of the state of the art methods for actually drawing photorealistic uh, content, even if it can be a little bit inefficient, um, at least until some very modern uh, developments in the ray tracing world. Okay, so I think most students in this course are familiar with the term rendering. They've probably run into it in, you know, video games or CAD software or whatever. Um, just to make sure we're all on the same page, the term rendering here refers to the procedure where you take the description of a scene. Typically in 3D is, is usually when we use the word rendering, but of course in, in vector graphics, uh, rendering also applies to 2D scenes. Uh, but in any event, uh, rendering takes a scene as a description, like all the objects in the scene, their colors, their materials, and so on, and converts those into an image on the, uh, the camera plane. So in rendering, um, in some sense, we're converting from this sort of infinite resolution description, maybe not infinite if you think of, of the triangles of the bunny as somehow the resolution of the geometry, um, into a very specific grid of values because that's what your screen knows how to display uh, at the end of the day. And so for each pixel, we're going to generate either a color or a grayscale value, like RGB. We'll talk a little bit more about color spaces much later in this course. Uh, 
Uh, and that's what is actually going to get sent to your computer monitor uh, for display. So I don't think there's a reason to harp on this term. I think most of us are familiar with it, uh, but it's important to uh, mention it um, just to, to make sure we all have the same terminology. Of course, when we do our rendering, uh, the other term that we're probably familiar with is pixel, right? So I think that's a pixel is short for picture element. Um, and essentially, uh, we can think of it as sort of a formalism. So in the basic pinhole camera setup, uh, that's the term that I've introduced at the top of the slide here. You think of your camera as sitting at some position in space. And you think of the image plane, like the pixels, as like a little square that's sitting in front of your eyeball. Conveniently, I'm looking at the uh, camera that I'm lecturing into, so I can kind of simulate it from both sides. Then what I can do is I can take a point, like at the center of my pixel, for example. Uh, maybe there's that point. And if I draw a ray from my eyeball or from my camera through that pixel, into the universe, essentially the color that gets displayed in that pixel is roughly the color of the first object that this ray from my eye into the world uh, runs into. So this particular model is called the pinhole camera, like the little pinhole sitting at the, the, the aperture of the camera. Uh, and indeed, um, that's going to be sort of the basic motivator for how we talk about the ray casting algorithm. What we're going to do is send these rays out from our eyeball into the world, figure out the first thing that they run into, and then figure out the color. That's it, it's really, it's pretty straightforward. Of course, computing the actual color is its own complicated uh, computation, right? Color um, is determined by the positions of the light, the shading, and there could even be really complicated effects. So for instance, one um, that we often talk about is subsurface scattering. Uh, so if you render a material like marble, if I hold a light bulb down on a piece of marble on one side, the light will kind of scatter through the material and exit in all kinds of uh, locations, um, which means that the color that I see is the result of light taking a very nonlinear and bouncy path to my eye. Um, of course, that's a very expensive uh, rendering effect. Okay, so to summarize, rendering refers to this process that produces color values given a representation of a 3D scene. And the pixels roughly correspond to rays, right? The rays from your eyeball into this kind of screen door structure, which is the uh, image plane sitting in front of you. There's a little bit of debate there, right? I mean, if you think of drawing the pixel like a little square sitting in front of your eye, maybe the color really should be the average color inside of that square. Uh, we're gonna discuss anti-aliasing in a few weeks, uh, and that's gonna be a really critical consideration when we get to that point. But for now, assuming that it's just one ray, like maybe the pixel is really, really small, um, our task is to figure out what object I'm actually seeing in that pixel. And then in a second step, we're going to compute the color. So that first step of saying for each pixel, what object is that pixel actually displaying, sometimes known as the hidden surface problem. Uh, and, and it's already basically a large part of the rendering pipeline. Now, there are two major algorithms for rendering. Uh, there's ray casting, um, which can get extended to ray tracing, and then there's rasterization. We're gonna talk a lot in this course about the distinction between these two techniques. We're gonna start with ray casting, which favors the quality of the image over the efficiency with which it's produced. Uh, and then, um, in a few lectures, we're gonna motivate rasterization, which at a high level is basically gonna just flip the order of two for loops. But of course, then the ways that we make it faster are completely different. And in rasterization, this is the algorithm that's typically built into your graphics card for, for rendering, right? So this is the distinction, again, at a very high and coarse level between super high quality graphics that can take forever to produce, interestingly using an arguably simpler algorithm, um, which would be ray uh, tracing, Whereas rasterization, uh, the bias is toward producing an image quickly and doing so in a really parallel fashion. So your graphics card is basically a rasterization machine. Okay, so today we're going to talk about the basics of ray casting. Um, we're going to define what that algorithm is uh, and then work out some specific examples of how it can be applied. So let's, let's get started. 
the rate casting algorithm is super, super simple. And in fact, if you want to implement the world's simplest tool for drawing a 3D scene composed of just a few objects, really, it's not more than a few lines of code. So the basic rate casting algorithm looks like what I've shown you on the slide here. On the outside, we're going to have a loop over all of the pixels in the image, right? Moving from one square in this uh, grid to the next. We're going to see that that loop can easily be parallelized. Then for each of those uh, grid points, we're going to choose a location and draw a ray from our eye through that pixel into the scene. And using that ray, our task now is going to be to figure out what object the ray hits first, right? So in this case, notice the, uh, the ray that I've drawn from my eye actually hits two spheres, right? It hits this one and it hits that one. So what sphere do we render? Well, clearly we should render the sphere that's closer to our, our image. So how are we gonna do that? We're gonna loop over every possible object in the scene for now, again, we'll find that there are ways to accelerate this. We're gonna intersect the ray with that object. And if the object is closer to the eye than the current closest thing, we'll keep that new object instead. So for example, maybe I iterate over all the objects in the scene. Maybe the first one is the cube and I say, oh, well, the ray doesn't hit the cube at all. So I know that I don't have to display the cube uh, in uh, that particular pixel. And then I find this intersection point with the farther sphere. I say, aha, I found an object. So maybe I should render that sphere. But then I find a new intersection point with the closer sphere. Well, that point is closer than the previous one I found. So actually I will end up rendering this sphere instead. And that's it, that's, that's the ray casting algorithm. Obviously there are a lot of details uh, that we haven't filled in. Uh, we need to talk about how to construct this ray, uh, we need to talk about how to intersect rays and objects. Um, and of course, uh, there's one additional step which I've omitted, which is you have to decide on exactly what color to put at that pixel once you've figured out what object you're shading. Let's say a few words on this last step, um, which largely I'm gonna defer. So for now, we're just gonna give you one really simple model for shading so that we can get started. And then later on, we're gonna talk more about different materials that can get different looks in your rendered scene. So shading is all about what surfaces look like. Um, obviously, if you look around you, uh, you'll see many different materials with different properties, right? The way that they react to shining a light bulb on them um, probably differs pretty drastically. So in order to perform shading, we typically need a lot of different pieces of information. We need the normal to the surface. As a bit of review, remember that a normal is a vector that points 90 degrees to the surface. You need to know where the light is. So for example, if you have a point light, maybe you can just draw a vector pointing directly toward it. Um, later, we're gonna talk about area lights, like big fluorescent lights on the ceiling, um, which are a little bit more complicated. Maybe you need to know where the camera is as well. So for example, if I'm looking at a metal object, then depending on where I place the camera, the color that I observe will be different. These are all properties of the scene around the object that you're trying to render. Uh, in addition to that, you need to talk about the material of the object itself. Uh, and of course, there are many different properties there. Um, there's the diffuse material. So for instance, here you see a perfectly diffuse sphere. Um, diffuse things have no reflective component. Light just goes in um, and then gets scattered everywhere. There might be a specular component. That's like the shininess, like what you see on the right-hand side. And finally, you might need positions of the light, um, and so on. Uh, and we'll see that there's all kinds of different effects that we can add. Um, for instance, I, I mentioned subsurface scattering earlier in today's lecture uh, that can create even more interesting shading materials. For now, we're gonna just work with the simplest shading model, which is the diffuse model. Roughly, we'll see that that looks like the amount of light that gets bounced off of a surface uh, is proportional to the dot product between the normal to the surface and the light. Uh, this is sometimes called the Lambertian shading model. We're gonna see a lot more of that in this course, but for now it's just because it's one line of code and, and can be used to render something. Um, so 
for 10 seconds of intuition on this particular shading model, remember that dot products are big when vectors are parallel. <laughs> and that kind of makes sense. So like if the sun is shining directly on my surface, then my surface should have the most light. If the light is just kind of grazing off of the surface, then the amount that it reflects off should be a lot smaller. And that's essentially all that's going on here. So uh, there's one distinction in terminology that I consider to be totally unimportant, <laughs> but everybody should be aware of because it does show up in some uh, technical papers, textbooks, and so on. And that's the distinction between ray casting and ray tracing. I'm going to get this wrong in our lectures because in my mind, these are pretty much identical algorithms. Uh, in some sense, ray casting is a special case of ray tracing. But in case you run into somebody that's being pedantic about that difference, let's, let's talk about it for a minute. Um, and in particular, let's think about shadows for a moment. So let's say that I'm rendering a scene and I'm looking at, you know, my, my scene, uh, my eyeballs over here, there's a light rendering my scene. Uh, there's, and there are two objects, a, a sphere and a rectangle. And now I'm trying to do my shading computation and I want to figure out how to draw the different objects in my scene. Well, of course, thanks to shadows, um, there's going to be a big shadow cast by this rectangular object, right? We'll look, you know, follow roughly the region that I've drawn here. This is sometimes called a shadow volume. We'll talk about that later. So in particular, should this spherical object be lit? No, it's not lit because it's sitting in the shadow of the rectangle. So here's how we might think about that in the context of ray casting, ray tracing. So in the ray casting algorithm that I've described for you all, I draw a ray from the camera into the scene and I figure out the first object it runs into. Then the next step in ray casting would be to do a lighting computation. So what could I do? Well, I could look at the light, Look at the normal to the surface, take the dot product and say, aha, these two vectors are close to one another. So maybe the surface should be really bright. Of course, if I do that, I make a mistake because there's a giant rectangle sitting in between. He needs some hair and ears. Okay, so what should I really have done? Well, I should notice that if I drew a ray from the light to the surface of the sphere, it gets blocked by the rectangle in between. Okay, so in the ray tracing algorithm, what we're gonna do is uh, kind of sneaky, which is, okay, let's say that I render my sphere. So the first thing I'll do is detect this intersection point. Now, I'm going to make a new ray that starts at the intersection point and points toward the light bulb. What do I know? I know that if that ray reaches the light bulb without hitting anything else, then I should shade this point and otherwise, that point is in a shadow. So in this case, I intersect that ray with all the objects in my scene and I say, aha, there's an intersection point with an object that is closer than the light, meaning that I'm in a shadow and I should not be lit by that light. So one thing that's really cool here, what did I need in order to draw that shadow? Did I need like a special, you know, segment of my code for computing shadows? Well, the answer is no, right? All I need is an abstract piece of code that in my 3D scene takes a ray and then tells you the first thing that it runs into. So for example, in our first ray casting step, I take a ray from my eye into the scene and the first object it runs into is the thing I should draw. But then for doing my lighting computation, I make a new ray from that intersection point into the scene again and depending on whether it ran into something else, I can figure out whether I was in a shadow. So that's the basic distinction between ray casting and ray tracing. Ray casting only involves that first level set of rays, namely the rays from your eye into the universe. The ray tracing algorithm also allows for secondary rays, which can figure out things like shadows. Uh, we'll see that reflection and refraction are handled nicely in this uh, setup uh, and so on. The reality is that almost everybody uses the term ray tracing to refer to both of these things. Um, so I wouldn't get too hung up on the distinction, uh, but it is worth knowing uh, and, and we'll try to be consistent about it in the slides. So the 
thing about ray tracing as an algorithm is that it is extremely, extremely powerful. This idea that this basic abstraction is the need to intersect a ray with objects in your scene allows you not only to just render boring diffuse spheres, but also to do things like re reflection. Um, uh, so for example, here's some reflective spheres, here's a reflective teapot. This is another uh, object in the uh, sort of big cast of computer graphics characters. Um, this Utah teapot is a famous model. Uh, and other effects like caustics, you know, so here you can see that the light is somehow getting focused through this piece of glass and casting an interesting shadow underneath. Um, in fact, there are all kinds of fun uh, lighting and shading effects that you can capture using ray tracing and eventually a technique called global illumination that we'll talk about in a few lectures. So not only can you do reflections and shadows, you can also um, deal with, you know, indirect illumination. So for example, the white material of the floor might receive a little bit of the red light bouncing off of the wall, even though it's diffuse uh, and so on. So that's what we're aiming for, but today we're going to keep it simple, like just drawing spheres and planes. And so now let's get into the, uh, the nitty gritty details. So we've talked a lot about ray tracing, ray casting. The first question you should ask is what is a ray? <laughs> and we've already talked about that in our lecture on parametric geometry, but just as a reminder, let's say that I have a uh, ray uh, from some point, like an eye, into the universe, like pointing at some other location. Then how could I represent this object mathematically? Of course, there are many different representations, but uh, there's one really simple one that I think we all know and love, which is as follows. Essentially, I'm going to think of a ray as a point, like an origin, maybe call it O for short. Sorry for my terrible handwriting. This laptop is tricky. Maybe there's another thing like the direction D. And I can think of my ray as the points P of T that can be written as the origin plus T times the direction. Right? So for instance, when t equals zero, I just get that origin point. And as d increases, I move farther and farther along in the direction. Notice that the sign, as I g n, of t actually matters here. So if t is negative, I'm at some location behind the eye. But that would mean I'm parametrizing a line rather than a ray. So when we talk about a ray, typically we constrain that t is non-negative. So when we talk about the ray casting problem, now that I've given you a mathematical representation of a ray, we can specify the problem uh, in a bit more precise language. So in particular, given a description of all the objects in our scene and a particular ray, for example, the ray from your eye into the universe, the ray casting problem says, find me the smallest positive T value so that P of T intersects one of the surfaces. So again, like let's say I was rendering a uh, box, I'd like to find the very first intersection point T that actually hits one of the surfaces that I'm observing. The reason that we have to use smallest is that of course, if there's another object farther away, that's actually irrelevant for shading, assuming that it's occluded by the box here. Now, why do we say T is greater than zero? Well, the smallest t could be negative, right? It could be that there's another box behind my eyeball, but that's also irrelevant for shading. Now, the ray casting, ray tracing algorithm has a very long and storied history, and it actually lasts longer than computer technology itself. Um, so for example, in the 16th century, artists were using uh, essentially ray casting and ray tracing techniques to get the right foreshortening and perspective transformations in uh, artistic uh, representations of the world. Um, these are super fun because essentially, even in the 16th century, people were doing some version of ray casting that looks an awful lot like what we code on our computer today. Um, so for example, here you see in the back, uh, there's some point that's kind of like the eyeball. And then our, our man uh, Albrecht here has basically drawn a straight line from the eyeball uh, into the world uh, and figured out the first object that it runs into uh, just using a pulley and a piece of string, right? So maybe I 
hold the piece of string at this intersection point, and then the pulley tugs down on the string so that it's taut. And now the intersection point here with the image plane is what I, uh, what I draw. This is a really sneaky, uh, sneaky technique. And this was useful because of course it's pretty difficult to draw this musical instrument at this crazy angle here um, and get the, the proper foreshortening. Remember foreshortening is like stuff that, that looks uh, like it shrinks as it moves away from the camera. Um, and really, this is in some sense one of the earliest uh, 3D scanners uh, in, in, in history here. And uh, he experimented with a lot of different techniques that all were built on this same basic uh, pinhole camera model. So, uh, for instance, here, uh, rather than holding the uh, string against the object itself, um, that made it hard to have an image plane, uh, you know, nearby. So instead, maybe you point some device at the object that you're observing and of course uh, wherever it intersects the image plane is, is where you should draw. Um, I'm told that real artists don't need to do these sorts of tricks uh, but of course uh, without them I don't think I would be able to draw any proper depth on a uh, 2D image. Even with them I really struggle but I'm, I'm a terrible artist. Okay so now uh, we know how to draw rays so the next thing we have to do in our uh, set up here the first thing is generate the rays that have something to do with the camera pose and the image plane right so we have a representation and now we have to figure out exactly which ray to draw so if we return to our ray casting algorithm remember we loop over every pixel we construct a ray from the eye into the universe and then we intersect that ray with every object let's talk about this step here right how do you construct a ray from your eye through a particular pixel into the scene. We have like lots of fun pictures from uh, mostly European artists that are trying to capture depth in different ways <laughs> and uh, you know, smoke their, uh, their cigarettes. Okay, so the basic model that we've already alluded to a number of times is the pinhole camera model. And with many of the uh, techniques that we'll talk about, uh, this model has its roots in the physical world rather than just algorithmically. Um, so in the pinhole camera model, I'm thinking of my camera like a giant box, what I've drawn here. And that box has a little tiny hole in its side, like right there. So why do I want just a tiny, tiny little hole? Well, essentially what that's gonna do is it's only gonna let in rays of light that pass through a very small point. So, What's going to end up happening? Let's say that I'm rendering this teapot. Well, the rays of light, you know, maybe the sun is over here somewhere. The rays of light hit that teapot. They go through this hole and they just keep going until they reach the far plane of the box. And that's where the light ends up inside of this pinhole camera. Um, and the smaller that the hole is, the kind of more perfect your image is. You don't end up with blurry um, artifacts or depth of field, that kind of thing. Uh, the pinhole camera model has been around a long time. Um, so for instance, in the, uh, what, the 16th century here, uh, you could actually build a physical pinhole camera. So maybe you <laughs> construct a room with, you know, nice... Uh, columns, of course, you don't want to be an architectural slouch. Uh, and now uh, you want to capture an image of the outside world uh, indoors. One thing you can do is just poke a really, really tiny hole in your wall. And now you're going to have all the rays of light from the universe go through that point and then cast an image on the back wall. Of course, in reality, there's a challenge, which is that the smaller that hole is, the less light there is and the darker you see this. But on the computer, we're going to be able to take care of that pretty easily. Um, so for instance, I think this room was used to study a solar eclipse in, in the, the 1500s. Uh, here's another example. Sometimes this is called the camera obscura effect. Um, I think this was, was coined by uh, Kepler, also at a similar period of time. Uh, and so you could actually use this technique to help you do your painting, right? So let's say that I wanted to paint probably this very bright outdoor scene. <laughs> well, I could put it adjacent to a very dark room 
and then use this pinhole camera model to cast it onto the image plane. And now rather than doing art, all I have to do is trace. <laughs> uh, and so this is again, a nice clever technique for uh, getting foreshortening and all these depth effects correct um, without having to just rely on your eyeball and your artist technique. Uh, these, are, these artists in these 1500s were, were pretty clever, really. Uh, and the, the pinhole camera persists today, but largely just in, in artistic uh, techniques. So for instance, uh, this artist, who I think is really cool, um, captures uh, pinhole cameras and in interesting apartments in like New York and Washington DC. Uh, and you actually, if you like turn out all the lights and only allow one little pinhole of light into your room, you can get a pretty nice image apparently of the uh, outside world uh, using this technique. So anyway, if you guys are bored, I, I, I highly recommend checking out his website. It's, it's got a lot of really cool content to uh, observe. Now, in our case, of course, we're not trying to actually simulate this uh, classical technique so we can make a lot of simplifications. Uh, in particular, rather than dealing with like an inverted image plane behind my eyeball, I can simulate an image plane sitting in front of my eyeball and not have so many sign mistakes in my code. Um, one thing that's worth noting is that the distance and size of the image plane are totally arbitrary, right? I would get the same rendered image whether I put the image plane on the left or the image plane on the right. What matters is just uh, the scale relative to the location of the eye and the color that you see when you trace a ray from your object through the plane into the real world. So in practice, when we want to describe a pinhole camera, like what I've given you here, uh, here's a pretty easy way to do it. So, of course, one thing I need to do is keep track of the location of the eye at some point here, right? So maybe that's E. I suppose in the uh, notation of our, what, third lecture, I could put a little tilde above that. Then we have a vector, uh, U, a vector V, and a vector W, um, which are an orthogonal basis that point horizontally up uh, and then out into the world, uh, respectively. So, uh, right, and, and this is enough to keep track of where the camera is and where it's pointing. Another useful thing that you might want to keep track of is the angle of the field of view, right? This is like the angle of this frustum as it goes into the eye. Incidentally, notice that I use this word frustum here. Frustum refers to this prism that starts at your eye and goes outward with this uh, quadrilateral uh, uh, shape when you slice it using the image planes. And then finally, you might want to keep track of the aspect ratio of the image uh, uh, rectangle, so the ratio of its width to its height. Okay, so uh, as always in this class, we have to deal with many different coordinate systems and translate from one into the other uh, quite frequently. Uh, so a very typical thing to do um, is to use image coordinates, uh, which are essentially just convenience for uh, rendering a scene. So a pretty typical thing to do is to just normalize both the X and Y coordinates to be between minus one and one um, for the rendered image. And this is actually regardless of aspect ratio. Um, this is a controversial decision. I don't think everybody does this anymore. Some of the old versions of OpenGL kind of mandated it. Um, but it is true that, that sometimes when people talk about image coordinates, uh, this is what they're referring to. On the other hand, these coordinates can be a little bit tricky to think about because they might distort your scene, right? Like if your image is two times wide as it is tall or something like that. Okay, so we set out to talk about ray generation. Let's actually do that. So let's say that I have um, an angle like uh, our field of view alpha here and I'm trying to draw a ray into my image plane, um, we can do a little bit of trigonometry to actually figure this out. So let's say that I have a point P and I'm trying to find its coordinates um, on the image plane. Well, what can I do? Well, I can say, what is the uh, distance to the screen? Um, so that the normalized coordinates are actually one. So for instance, if I specify just the field of view, then I have to kind of figure out how far away I should go before that rectangle, right, it gets bigger as I move from my eye, has the, uh, the correct width. Doing that's just a trigonometry exercise. So of course, 
Uh, notice we have a right triangle here. Its width is one, its depth is D, and this lower angle here is alpha over two. So if I do a little bit of trig, we find that um, the, uh, the distance where I should put this sort of virtual image plane is one over the tangent of alpha over two, also known as the cotangent of alpha over two. Um, so uh, with all that information, I can figure out that point P uh, pretty easily uh, and, and reverse engineer location. I think in practice, incidentally, people don't always do this. Um, I think an easier representation is you have an I point E, you have a point out there in the universe, which is the uh, sort of center of your image plane, and then you have an up and a right vector from there. Um, that's somehow easier to work with. I think that's what we give you in your assignment too. Um, so indeed, uh, you know, that was just a 2D picture. 3D is no harder. You just kind of flip uh, the picture when you're talking about the Y coordinate. Uh, computing that D uh, is useful essentially if you're trying to figure out where to put that virtual image plane um, in order to work in these normalized coordinate systems uh, between minus one and one. And again, doing so is often optional, depends on the graphic system you're working with. All right, so uh, that's not the only model for a camera, this pinhole camera model that we've been discussing. And of course, it's important to highlight a few more. Here's another example, which is the uh, difference between a perspective and an orthographic camera. So orthographic drawing is important and useful in the engineering world in particular. So in orthographic drawing, um, essentially all of your rays, rather than coming from an eye into the world, you just have a plane. All of the rays have identical direction and they move in parallel to one another, just starting from different pixels moving outward. Now, as objects move farther and farther away from your camera, um, the pinhole camera model starts to look like the orthographic uh, rendering model. Um, but the orthographic camera, even if it's not physical, can be useful because, for instance, if you need to measure, oops, uh, measure distances uh, that are not parallel to the uh, camera plane, uh, the orthographic projection allows you to do that uh, in a fashion that makes a little more sense. Uh, Setting up your orthographic camera and producing rays for that model is arguably actually easier than generating rays for the pinhole camera model uh, because of course the direction now is just some constant and the origin is just some shifted uh, location where you shift it along the two directions of the uh, 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 camera here. There's a whole universe of different cameras that people use both artistically and uh, for different scientific purposes. Uh, so for example, uh, there, there's fisheye cameras, like what you see on the left, Omnimax, parabolic, and so on. Um, and all of these basically just correspond to different ways to generate the directions of rays um, in your, your universe, right? So at the end of the day, what you need is for each pixel in your scene, you have to decide that that pixel corresponds to some ray and that the first thing that that ray runs into is what you're going to shade at that pixel. Now, one of the really fun things um, is that you don't even have to have a physical camera, uh, right? We're in the digital universe. So maybe we get really creative and invent non-physical cameras that are useful or, or create cool artistic or, or visualization effects. So one of my favorite examples is a technique called multi-perspective imaging. As you can see, this is not a particularly physical way to render an elephant. You know, most elephants I think have four legs. Um, but here's what's going on. What I'm gonna do is like, let's say that, you know, I have an elephant. So here, here he is. See, he's got four feet and a head and a trunk. Uh, and now I want to render this thing. So in the pinhole camera model, I would place a camera somewhere and I'd start generating rays like that. But again, the only thing we have to decide on is like at a particular, oops, at a particular location in my image, the color of that location co should correspond to some ray that I generate in the computer, right? And that procedure for generating rays can be physical, like for the pinhole camera, but I could also just make it up and have a cool effect like, like unraveling my scene here. So to do multi-perspective imaging, um, this was a technique that was invented 
so that you could try and visualize, for example, both sides of this elephant uh, in one rendered image. What they did is they kind of put a camera on a uh, parabolic track around the uh, elephant. So if I think of my elephant and now I surround my elephant with a toilet paper tube, I can start producing rays that kind of move inward toward the elephant from that toilet paper cube, uh, tube. And uh, I can use that to render uh, this object, right? So this would be kind of like panning a camera around the outside of the elephant and then making like the first column of the final image be the first column from the first pixel, the second column uh, image, the second column is the second column from the second image and so on. And you get this cool effect. Um, I would love for somebody to implement multi-perspective imaging as an extra credit on the ray tracing assignment in this course and it's, it really wouldn't be so hard. Okay, so at this point, uh, remember what's our basic ray casting algorithm? We loop over all the pixels. For each pixel, we generate a ray into the universe. We've now talked about how to do that. Our next step is to actually figure out what that ray runs into. And that's what we're gonna spend the rest of our lecture today trying to do. In particular, we're gonna talk about rendering two of the world's least interesting shapes, uh, namely planes and spheres. <laughs> okay. Now, the plane ray intersection algorithm is gonna be particularly easy. I think you guys could all do this at home using the linear algebra that you know and love. But it's also worth working out in some detail uh, because ray plane intersection is the first step toward ray triangle intersection. And of course, triangles are the basic building blocks of objects that we tend to render in the graphics universe. Okay, so just to continue to, you know, put our, our lecture in the right place, uh, remember that our, our ray casting algorithm generates rays. That was what we talked about last. And now we're going to talk about intersecting the rays with the objects in our scene. Okay, so let's get started. Recall that our basic ray representation, oops, that should be a subscript, uh, is what I've drawn on the screen here, right? That array you can think of like R naught, this would be the origin, plus T times RD, where T is describing how long along the ray I should move before I run into an object. In the terminology of the second lecture of this course, I'm afraid you guys are responsible for all the material here, uh, we would call this an explicit representation of array. Now that's not referring to the, uh, <laughs> the language that we use to describe array, um, but rather the fact that I have an explicit function that goes from t's to points in space. I parametrize my geometry. Now, how could I describe a plane? Well, there are a lot of different ways. I think here's a formula that we all know and love. Um, which is uh, that I can define a plane using two pieces of information, a single point on my plane, P naught, and the normal vector to my plane, N. And now I can write an implicit equation for my plane. Um, here, uh, how could I do that? Well, when is a point actually in my plane? Well, one thing that I can do is I can draw a vector from P naught to my point P, say that P is equal to X, Y, Z. And P is in the plane exactly when that vector is orthogonal, 90 degrees, to the normal vector. Okay, so in other words, what do we know? We know that zero is equal to, how do we, oh, sorry, I, I forgot. We check whether two things are orthogonal by taking their dot products and checking if it's zero. So in this case, zero is equal to n dot, well, we need this vector from p naught to p, right? That's what I'm showing you on the right-hand side here. And that's nothing more than p minus p naught. Okay, so let's expand this. So we have that zero is equal to n dot p minus n dot p naught. Now p naught is just, some arbitrary point on our plane. So this quantity here, this is a constant, right? So in particular, we just learned that D in the equation of our, our plane is minus N dot P naught. 
and a, b, and c, you'll recognize this expression here as a dot product, right, between x, y, and z, and a, b, and c. So, in other words, a, b, c had better be the normal vector to our plane because that's what appears in our expression here. Okay, so by the magic of uh, PowerPoint, uh, here we are. Uh, here's our implicit equation of a plane, right? Our plane is the locus of points P that satisfy the relationship that I've written in the box here. Incidentally, if N is a unit vector, so in other words, if N is normalized, uh, computing the distance from a point to the plane is as easy as evaluating this function here. Um, it's actually a signed distance. It can be positive or negative, and that just tells you whether you're above the plane or below it with respect to its normal vector. Uh, I'll let you guys work that one out at home. For now, it's just like kind of a fun fact, uh, but it's something that you can derive pretty easily using linear algebra machinery. So remember our goal here. Our goal, we have our eyeball. He or she uh, uh, computes a ray into the world, and we're trying to figure out if and where that ray runs into our plane. Now we've got kind of a funny scenario, right? Our ray is described using an explicit equation, like parametric geometry, and our plane is described using an implicit equation, right? It's a, the, the locus of all points where the expression I've given you is equal to zero. So the question is, how do we figure out where our ray intersects the plane? Well, what can we do? In some sense, our task is to figure out the t along our ray that runs into the plane. And of course, it runs into the plane exactly when this thing is equal to zero. So in other words, we want that zero is equal to h of p of t. And our goal is to figure out which t this is the case. Okay, so let's expand a little bit. So h of p, that's equal to n dot p, but p of t is r naught plus t r d plus d uh, so this entire expression equals zero of course i can expand the dot product here so this is and i'm going to refactor to gather the term next to t right so we have n dot r d times t plus n dot r naught plus d. So in other words, we have t is equal to minus n dot r naught plus d divided by n dot r d. Now that I glance uh, up at my slides, yes, we got the expression right. So uh, thank you to PowerPoint for uh, replacing my ugly um, handwriting here. So here we have the equation of a ray and the equation of a plane, respectively. We plug one into the other, solve for t, and that's the expression that we get here. So again, what is this thing telling me? It's telling me if I move along my ray to parameter t, the point that I'll get is in the plane that I'm trying to intersect. Of course, if t is negative, then we'll be in some trouble, right? It'll be behind my eyeball somewhere. Um, Whenever you see an expression like this, of course, you should debug it a little bit and make sure you understand. Um, and you might do a little bit of a sanity check and say, well, wait a second, Justin. What happens if this value here is equal to zero? Right? Then I'm dividing by zero, and what's that about? That essentially is telling me that my ray doesn't intersect the plane. And that can actually happen. Namely, like if the ray is somewhere uh, moving parallel to the surface, then the two will never actually meet. And that corresponds exactly to the case where n dot rd is equal to zero. Uh, there's a little bit of bookkeeping we should do, of course. When we do ray casting, what matters is that the plane is in front of the camera. So if t is negative, uh, then we should probably dispose of it. Um, by the way, typically, you might want to have a small but positive t min, so that stuff that's like right on top of your eyeball doesn't mess with the uh, rendering algorithm. We'll talk about that more later. 
A different thing that we should also do in our bookkeeping for the ray casting algorithm is double check that t is less than t current, right? So in this case, there's actually a sphere in the way of that plane. So that whole computation ended up being irrelevant. Of course, now that we figured out that the plane is in front of us, we may want to render it. In order to do that, we need the normal vector to the plane. Uh, and thankfully, that's actually built into the equation of the plane. So it's pretty easy to get. It's just constant. Um, there's one bug, incidentally, that can happen. So let's say that I'd want to draw the plane and it's two-sided, like I want one side to be red and one side to be green or something like that. Uh, then essentially you'll distinguish between the two sides using the normal vector. But at the same time, for doing your lighting computation, you probably want the normal vector that's facing your eye. Um, so you may need to flip the sign of the normal vector since this plane doesn't really have like an inside and an outside or something like that. Okay, and that's it. Now we know how to intersect rays with planes. We can have the world's least interesting ray tracer that can only draw worlds composed of infinitely long flat objects. <laughs> okay. So our next topic is to talk about ray casting spheres, and then we're gonna be able to render a world composed of spheres on planes. Uh, and so this is largely just as an example of the ray casting algorithm Moving from spheres to other algebraic surfaces is pretty straightforward. Um, so we're just going to do this as, as an example. Later on in this course, uh, when you see the past exams, you'll see that it's a pretty typical topic to ask you to invent a technique for ray casting or ray uh, tracing for a particular weird piece of geometry given by an equation like a sphere. Okay, so how do we represent a sphere? For now, let's assume your sphere is centered at the origin. It's pretty easy to take care of cases where that's not true. So what is this a, a sphere centered at the origin? Well, it's exactly the set of points where the norm of P is equal to R. Norm is a little bit weird. It's not actually differentiable. It's kind of like absolute value. So a pretty typical thing to do might be to square it. Okay, so in other words, if I subtract R from both sides, I get the expression here, right? The, the norm of P squared minus R squared equals zero. And of course, the norm of a vector squared is the same thing as the vector dot product with itself. So our task now is to figure out the point where a ray starting at your eye intersects a sphere. So how are we gonna do that? Well, it's pretty similar to the computation we just did for a plane. Right? So we have this explicit expression for a ray. Right, It starts at R0 and it goes in direction of Rd. We now have an implicit equation for the sphere, Right, that P dot P equals R squared. So what are we going to do? Well, we're just going to plug one into the other and solve for T. So let's do that. Uh, in particular, we have zero equals P dot P. So that's r naught plus t r d dot product with the same thing. All that minus r squared. So anytime we have an expression like this, it should be screaming out at us to expand the square. Let's do that. What are we going to end up with? Well, r naught dot r naught. Right, that's like the uh, left terms. You know, we're doing FOIL, right? So first outer inner L, <laughs> last. <laughs> um, now let's do the uh, outer and inner terms, um, both of which are going to be 2t times the dot product r naught dot rd, right? That's like the product of these two terms. And then finally, we'll do the dot product of the last terms, and we'll get t squared rd dot rd. And then we don't want to forget the minus r squared. Okay, so let's uh, factor our expression slightly differently. So what we're going to do is we're going to factor out all the, the different powers of t. So the highest power of t is 2. So we'll have rd dot rd t squared, right? That's this term here plus 2r0 dot r, oops, rd t, right, that's this term, 
plus r naught dot r naught minus little r squared. Okay. Now, let's just make a few definitions. Let's call this thing a, this thing b, and this thing c. Right? These are just three constants. Do you see that? There's no. Um, these are just kind of properties of the sphere uh, and properties of the ray uh, getting stirred together in different ways. So now I can write mm -hmm. a t squared plus b t plus c. And remember, uh, if we step back 10 feet and, and, and think about what our task was, it was to solve for t. Okay, well, all of a sudden, you guys should be like super excited. How do I solve expressions uh, that are given in this form? Well, this is a quadratic equation, right? So all of you should be like shaking in your boots, ready to tell us that it's, you know, negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared uh, minus 4ac, all of that over 2a, yeah? So let's uh, unravel that a little bit. So here, again, is the same expression I had on the previous slide. Remember, we're calling uh, this guy uh, A, this is B, this is C, and our task is to solve for T, okay? Um, incidentally, uh, by the way, oftentimes, oh, I'm sorry, that should be a subscript. Um, a might be just one if the uh, uh, if the direction of our ray uh, has unit length, but you might also not want to assume that. I'm noticing that uh, in my slides I, I kind of said a equals one, but this is this is optional. You can also do actually just compute rd dot rd, and that's probably better. Like really, we we want this. Might as well have the most general version of the code. Um, B is our D dot R zero uh, with a two in front of it and C is that difference. So how do we solve these problems? Well, you can compute the discriminant and then assuming that the thing inside of the square root is non-negative, uh, I get the following solutions for T. Now that's, that's exciting. This is something we can code. It's just a formula, but you should be a little bit suspicious, right? Because I got two values for T, but at the end of the, t the day, the ray can only intersect uh, the sphere one time. So what's going on here? In fact, there are a bunch of different cases, right? When the discriminant is negative, I don't get any t value. When the discriminant is zero, I get one t value. And the discriminant is, is bigger than zero, I get two t values. And why is that? Well, here's a sphere in two dimensions. <laughs> um, here's a ray with no t values for the intersection. If the ray just grazes the side of the sphere, then I'll get one t value for the intersection. And if it goes through the sphere, I'll get two t values for the intersection. So in fact, the discrimination, uh, the discriminant actually tells us useful information about our sphere ray intersection problem. So I guess I've already answered this question on my slide. Now we know what these different cases correspond to. Of course, in the context of ray tracing, we have to ask which route we actually should choose when we do that intersection. And remember the rule we've already introduced. You want the closest positive root T because that's the one that corresponds to your eye. You have to be a little bit careful here. So for example, um, let's say that I'm actually sitting inside the sphere, right? Because for instance, I think it's tempting to just say, take the smallest t, but that's actually not true, right? So in this case, there will be one negative t and one positive t, and I should choose the positive one, even though it's the larger of the two roots. Okay, so if we inter uh, introduce a ray sphere intersection, um, then we can draw super cool scenes like the one that I'm showing you here, uh, which is composed just of spheres and, and infinite planes. Uh, of course, really to do this, we'll have to do uh, some reflection and we'll, we'll talk about how to handle that in the coming lectures. Um, right, so one additional piece of information we need uh, for rendering a sphere is its normal direction. That's actually pretty easy to obtain. So let's say that Q is the intersection point between our sphere and the ray from our eye. 
Well, uh, hopefully you all remember that you can get the normal vector by just subtracting um, Q from the center point of the sphere. Okay, these two vectors are 90 degrees, and you probably want to divide this by its length so that it's a unit vector. So in other words, um, if Q is this vector starting at zero and pointing toward uh, the intersection point, then Q divided by its norm is the surface normal. Okay. So here's some more <laughs> sphere art that you can do uh, with ray tracing. There's a huge uh, library of art that people have made just as spheres uh, because it's the easiest thing to ray trace. Okay, so that concludes the basic technical part of our lecture today. Um, you can see that we've covered how to deal with two basic pieces of geometry uh, in our rendering system. Um, or really when I say deal, I mean at least detect that it's in front of your camera and maybe render it using a simple model like Lambertian shading. Um, we've talked about how to get not only uh, the intersection point, but also the uh, normal direction and some of the subtleties that can point up. For example, um, in intersecting rays with spheres, we got multiple intersection points and we have to be quite careful to choose the correct one and that's like a super easy source of bugs in ray tracing code. I see it all the time in people's assignments in this course. So as a quick recap, um, we covered uh, what rendering means, right? Remember, it means taking a description of a scene and outputting the colors of all the pixels in the scene, or in the image, rather. We talked about the basics of ray casting, namely intersecting rays with planes and intersecting rays with spheres. And finally, we talked about how to intersect rays, uh, uh, and yikes, next time, <laughs> rather, uh, we're going to talk about how to intersect rays with triangles, right? That's going to allow us to render meshes, which are super important. And we'll talk about the ray tracing algorithm, like what can we do uh, given this piece of code that can just take an arbitrary ray and intersect it with the scene um, so that when we render an object, not only do we render that object, we bounce the ray and produce all kinds of secondary rays to get effects like reflection, shadows, and so on. So as promised, we've ended a little bit earlier. I think today uh, this is one of the easier lectures in 6837. Uh, and next time we'll pick up with talking about barycentric coordinates and triangles. So I'll see you then.